Hello and welcome to The Arise interview where we take time to reflect on the big stories from the news and on the fortunes and affairs of the world in an hour of conversation with commentators, analysts and thought leaders. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, since the decision in 2007 to create the US Africa Command or AFRICOM, the operation has drawn lots of attention, attracting some praise and a lot of criticism from leaders in Africa. Some of them went so far as to discourage African Union members from hosting any US base or American troops, claiming that their presence could be destabilizing. But AFRICOM has insisted that its mission is largely non-military and involves training African soldiers and delivering aid and resources. Nevertheless, fears about U.S. militarization of the continent continue to simmer. So, more than 20 years after AFRICOM was set up, what's the state of play today? We'll speak exclusively to the first commander of the U.S. Africa Command, or AFRICOM, General William Kip Ward. Coming up. Now, it's been two decades since the U.S. president at the time, George W. Bush, gave authority to the American Department of Defense to create a new U.S. Africa Command, or AFRICOM. Prior to this, responsibility for U.S. military operations in Africa was divided across three unified commands. But following the continent's growing strategic importance to Washington, calls for the creation of a specific Africa Command that would be responsible for U.S. military operations on the continent, such as fighting regional conflicts and maintaining regional military relations with African nations, grew louder. In February 2007, the logistical framework for the new African command was set up in Stuttgart, Germany. And the man who was given charge of introducing AFRICOM to military leaders on the continent was a four-star general, William Kip Ward who traveled across Africa trying to sell the idea. So, 20 years later, what's become of AFRICOM? And why is insecurity growing on the continent despite or in spite of it? Well, in a moment, we'll speak to General William Ward himself. But first, here he is a few years ago speaking as the inaugural commander of AFRICOM. The United States Africa Command does what your Africa Command does and this work in the continent of Africa and its Indian Ocean Island nations, those efforts are directly in line with pursuit of United States national security interests. The strategic importance of Africa is about stability and growth, and that is in the best interest of the United States of America. The dissolution of governance, whereby the influence of drug trafficking becomes excessive or the military becomes too politicized is also a concern. An example is West Africa's role as a potential transit point in the global trade between South America, Europe, and the United States. The greater issue is not that these challenges exist in Africa, but the Africans lack the means to totally and fully confront them. They therefore retain some dependency on outside assistance for their security capacity. In some cases, the resources are available, but are not fully aligned to confront today's challenges. This dependence limits the Africans' progress in other sectors because direct foreign involvement in their internal affairs is an irritant and a distraction. U.S. efforts to help Africans address their challenges are focused on indirect methods, a combination of diplomatic, developmental, and defense engagements programs and activities that help build capacity, that help foster African ownership, and all the while leading to sustained progress and greater stability for the continent of Africa. This is clearly a long-term endeavor, long-term endeavor. The development or transformation of security capacities does not happen overnight and in many cases will happen on an African, not an American, timetable. I'm delighted, nonetheless, to say that General William Kip Ward, the first commander of the U.S. Africa Command, or AFRICOM, joins me now from Washington. You were, of course, the first inaugural commander of the U.S. Africa Command, and when you first took over, 
you, you spent quite a lot of time, didn't you, um, explaining and justifying the setting up of the U.S. Africa Command and trying to counter suspicions and misunderstandings. I mean, I I is it fair to say that those misgivings, though they became reduced and um, allowed AFRICOM to become operational, continued to dog your command for most of your time there? Well, as you pointed out, Charles, uh, they were present at the beginning, but clearly they were reduced significantly and substantially uh, as we established the command. And as several heads of state uh, told me, the reason that those suspicions were reduced was because the work that was being done, the, the activities that were being conducted reflected the true purpose. And the purpose was not to do as many indicated, i.e. to establish a militarization of our policy, but clearly indeed to be a supporting force in the helping the African nations be better able to protect themselves and provide for their own security. It was not the intent then, nor is it the intent today for the United States to be the sole purveyor provider of that support. And I believe all that we talked about then and all that we accomplished at that time reinforced that message. And so while the rhetoric continues, uh, the actuality has been not the case. And many of our African friends and, and partners uh, realize that and, con and continue to welcome the presence of the United States African Command on the continent. And uh, General Ward, on the operational side, I mean, how extensively did AFRICOM become involved in peacekeeping efforts in Africa and fighting terrorism, which is pretty much really, let's face it, what Africans want to see? Well, again, the, the command became involved as we provided training support and assistance to support the African nations as they were doing the product preponderance of that work uh, had we taken it over in total it would have been exactly what was being criticized for and so that was truly a dichotomy in the approach and so our approach was to, to provide support where one that support was requested coordinated with and with the consent of our african partners and that work continues today uh, in varying parts of the continent but let me be very clear, uh, that is not the primary mission of the command. Uh, the work that was done to support and increase the opportunity for African nations themselves to provide for their own security uh, through the increased professionalization of their military and security forces, uh, that was important then and that remains important today. Those things aren't talked about a lot, but those clearly are the things that are being done with respect to the support and assistance that's provided as Africans do what was said by Nelson Mandela, provide for their own security, but with, the, but with the support of their friends. And that's where we are. Well, I, I apologize, um, General, if I made you repeat yourself there. We, we had a bit of a comms problem initially, but, but I, I'm glad to say that that uh, problem is sorted now. So let me Wonderful. ask you this. Would you say that the U.S. Africa Command or AFRICOM has yielded the kind of security and stabilization results that were intended when it was set up? Well, th th there are two things there, Charles. <clears throat> Firstly, the, re the responsibility for doing all that was clearly not on the shoulders of, the, of AFRICOM. AFRICOM was there to, to, to assist the and when you look at the security environment, the state, the stability environment, their requirements there are very, very complex. Uh, the role that's being played by the security uh, forces of the various nations, uh, the role that the United States plays through its U.S. Africa Command and providing support to those efforts are but a part of that, of that debate, of that scenario. And so it's these other things also are critically important. And in my retirement, I talk a lot about those aspects of it as well. But from the standpoint of what AFRICOM has done, and it, as it has worked with partner militaries, 
some more receptive to it than others to provide the type of support that they request and let me also be very clear about that AFRICOM is not doing things that because we say or they the command says it wants to do AFRICOM does those things uh, that are one in accordance with the united states overall national policy and two the interests that the partner nations have themselves determined are important to them that these then activities will support and uh, further further along so it's both of those that are going on so it's not as if AFRICOM is there operating as some independent entity irrespective of the will of our national leadership president congress secretaries and our partner nations its leadership and its national interests so both of those come together to then inform the activities the support the coordination the actions that are being conducted by AFRICOM okay um we'd we'll like to talk with you some more general so please stay with us you're watching the arise interview plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with general william kip ward the inaugural commander of the u.s africa command or africom stay with us Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Zanyagul, and my guest today is a former U.S. four-star general, William Kip Ward, who made history in 2007 after the U.S. Senate confirmed him as the first commander of the U.S. Africa Command, or AFRICOM, soon after it became officially operational. The move suggested that unlike before, when Africa had been subsumed under other regional commands, the continent was being given strategic priority by Washington. The idea was to enhance U.S. efforts to bring peace and security to African people and to promote American goals of development, democracy and economic growth on the continent. Without security, it was reasoned, there would not be development. Well, there were mixed reactions to the command's creation, with some Africans greeting the news with skepticism, even though the Pentagon was careful to stress that AFRICOM would partner with African countries to promote mutual interests. We'll talk about all that in a moment with the inaugural commander of the U.S. Africa Command General William Kip Ward. But first, here he is being introduced all those years ago at the respected U.S. Center for Strategic International Studies. General Ward, as you know, became the first commander of the newly established Africa Command in 2007. Uh, he was commissioned in the infantry in 1971 and I think you'll still hear a lot of references to foxholes in his speeches. Uh, his military education includes the infantry off uh, officer basic and advanced courses, U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, and the U.S. Army War College. Uh, he was born and raised in Baltimore and attended Morgan State University as an undergraduate and then went on to get a master's at uh, Penn State. Uh, he originally planned to be a lawyer, but I think inspired uh, by his uh, ROTC time and probably by his father, who was a World War II veteran, Pretty good, Jennifer. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> joined the military, and we're very glad he did. We have plenty of lawyers, but not so many commanders of the Africa Command. So, uh, His service has included overseas tours in Korea, Egypt, Somalia, Bosnia, Israel, two tours in Germany, and a wide variety of assignments uh, in the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii. Prior to his uh, current position, General Ward was deputy commander with the European Command and had been uh, the deputy commanding general, chief of staff, U.S. Army Europe, and 7th Army. Uh, his rise to the ranks has included 12 command and troop assignments and 16 staff assignments. I won't go through the litany. He's got a big uh, chest full of uh, medals and awards there, too. Um, but General Ward, is, as Dr. Hamry said, is overseeing the stand-up of uh, the Africa Command, a new kind of command, um, one um, that seeks first and foremost to really build African security capacities in a sustained, integrated way, but at the same time uh, needs to be prepared for more direct forms of intervention um, should U.S. interests and policies uh, warrant it. AFRICOM was launched at a time in which big questions about the role of the U.S. military vis-a-vis -vis civilian agencies was playing out in, a, in a, a global stage. And this new command, which was trying to do things in a somewhat different way, became a vessel, I think, in which many of those debates played out. Uh, so General Ward has had the complicated task of not only staffing and setting up this brand new command, 
and getting on with its core functions, uh, but also explaining again and again, very patiently, to multiple audience uh, in the face of some fairly heated criticism, what the command is and, and what it's not about. Um, at the same time, he spent a great deal of time traveling throughout Africa, really, I think, getting a sense of African security priorities um, I, to, um, to really understand how best the U.S. can bring its capabilities to bear uh, uh, for greatest effect. And that was quite a few years ago, and uh, General William Kip Ward, the first commander of the U.S. Africa Commando AFRICOM, is still with me from Washington. Thank you very much indeed for staying uh, with us. And while you were the commander of the U.S. Africa Command General, I, I think about a couple of years after you took over, the Boko Haram insurgency really took off in Nigeria and almost crippled the security mechanism that Nigeria and other neighboring countries put together to confront uh, that type of um, problem. What did you make then, and what do you make now of how that insurgency has evolved and of the way the Nigerians have dealt with it over the last decade or so? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Charles. <clears throat> and yes, the, this, that part of the continent, of, and particularly the part of Nigeria, uh, was also going through some difficulties in 2007 and 2008, <clears throat> clearly not to the degree that uh, has occurred lately. And during those times, the ability of the Nigerian security forces to, to deal with the Boko Haram situation was being somewhat checked. And I say that because of the situation not being as severe as it is today. Uh, there were clearly those who would seek to disrupt the society at play, uh, but there were also forces uh, going on uh, with respect to the Nigerian security forces that were dealing with the scenario. And it's clearly over the years, uh, the last uh, decade uh, has gotten to the point where it's certainly worse. The conditions are worse. The ability of the security forces to deal with those conditions are, are worse. Those things that are being done from the standpoint of providing necessary support to the people are not being done to the degree that they need to be done so that the conditions are not present that allow these terrorists, these bandits to roam and do what they do in a unabated and free fashion. And so the scenario clearly has not where it was uh, in 2006, 2007, 2008 time frame. It has gotten worse over the years. And to deal with that problem requires a concerted effort across multiple fronts. Uh, clearly the security front, but also in those things that are being done to provide additional support to the people beyond just security so that their well-being, uh, their well-being is also enhanced and they become less susceptible to these nefarious actors and those who would do harm to them as opposed to not. And so it has to happen across multiple, uh, multiple lanes. Uh, as, was, as you heard in that opening uh, piece there, when I was at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, I fully recognized then, and I believe it's still recognized today, that to address the security challenges, to address the, the stability challenges, requires a good proportional measure of economic advancements, advancements in the governance situation, and advancements in the ability of security forces to effectively do their job to create a better situation for the people who live in the northern part of Nigeria that are now being impacted by Boko Haram and other bad actors that take advantage of that situation. But I mean, what I'm wondering, General, is, is given the fact that uh, part of the remit of um, the, the US-Africa command is to 
try and intervene in certain circumstances, particularly when the potential for destabilization appears to be very high. I mean, Boko Haram are not just um, uh, attacking northern Nigeria, they're attacking quite a number of other countries in, in the sub-region. I mean, I, I wonder whether what's happening there, uh, how much it should be a concern for the, the United States. We've got a minute before we take a break, but we can come back and continue. So please go ahead. Well, it, it is clearly a concern. And again, I go back to a statement that was made uh, earlier. The, the role of the United States is not the role, and it's not why Africa was established to be the only actor to be fully doing those missions. We do it in conjunction with our partners, because it is, in fact, Nigeria is a sovereign nation, and it has the ability to do things, and where our support and assistance is, is asked for, is requested, and where our foreign policy objectives are then supported by that, re that request, then Africa comes in and does what it has been asked to do in meeting those foreign policy objectives of the United States, as well as the national security objectives of the sovereign nation with whom we partner. And so what I don't want to do is leave an impression that it is the United States or can't be any other nation that would go in and fully take over and do those sorts of missions. Okay, um, I'm going to ask you, General, to just stay with us. So we're going to take a break. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with General William Kip Ward, the first commander of the U.S. Africa Command or AFRICOM. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyagolu. My guest today is a former U.S. four-star general, William Kip Ward, the first commander of the U.S. Africa Command, or AFRICOM, after it was created by George W. Bush and became officially operational in 2007. Prior to that, General Ward served as deputy commander, United States European Command. After he left Africa Command, he served as a special assistant to the Army's Vice Chief of Staff and subsequently retired in November 2012. He was first commissioned into the infantry in 1971. His military service includes overseas tours in Korea, Egypt, Somalia, Bosnia, Israel, two tours in Germany, and a wide variety of assignments in the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii. Since retiring, General Ward has served as President and Chief Operating Officer of the Logistics, IT and Engineering Business Vectris and continues to engage the strategy and policy community on matters of global security. And General William Kip Ward, the first commander of the U.S. Africa Commando, AFRICOM, is still with me from Washington. Thank you very much indeed, General, for staying with us. And when you look at all these insurgencies that are mushrooming across Africa in Nigeria, the Sahel countries of Mali, Burkina Faso, Mauritania, etc., Mozambique, Somalia, DRC, I mean, these conflicts have grown from relatively small scale issues a decade ago with jihadists who were not very well armed attacking villages to pretty big battles with well armed groups. I mean, why has it been so difficult for the military in Africa to put down these insurgencies? You know what, uh, Charles, the militaries in Africa uh, require a couple of things in order to be able to effectively provide for the security of their, their citizens. Uh, it, they require training. They require resources. They require institutional support that causes them to be professional forces as opposed to not. One of the things that I often would say to my friends on the continent with respect to their military forces, the security forces. Now, how well trained are they? How equipped are they? And, and I'm not talking necessarily about the most modern and expensive equipment, but the, main, the maintenance of that equipment. Can they depend on it? Do they have confidence in themselves? Do they have confidence in their equipment? And so the scenarios that you just described, because clearly that's not the situation across the entire continent. Uh, but clearly there are uh, there are locations that you pointed out where that is the case and in those situations 
The requirement is that the militaries, one, are well trained, better trained than some of them may be. The equipment must be operational and functional so that the confidence level and then finally the leadership, not just leadership at the highest levels, but leadership at echelon. You know, the, the sergeants, the non-commissioned officers, uh, the junior officers are trained, understand the mission, receive the equipment, the support that they require and have the confidence to go out and do the job to protect their forces, the question to protect their, their people. And so when you have lapses or you have gaps in those sorts of things, then their effectiveness as a force is reduced. And in some cases, even opposite of that, they become predators on their people as opposed to protectors of their people. So we want militaries all over the place, quite candidly, to be in a little analogy that I would use, if a little child in a country looks up and sees a soldier or security person, are they running to them to hug them around their knees or are they running away from them? And it is the job of not just the military because if you have a military that operates as we would want it to operate in a democratic society where the civilian leadership is the ultimate scenario that's in charge, then you have militaries where those Soldiers then are seen as protectors and not suppressors. And so all of those factors have to come together and this to cause a situation to be such that militaries are effectively a part of the fabric of a society in conjunction with governance that makes sense, in conjunction with the things that make a difference to the people in the form of the services that they receive, the health that they receive. And again, as a soldier, I'm aware of all of these things, not just the mere fact of dropping a bomb or shooting, shooting a tank or because it's more than that. To solve us, these sorts of things that you were describing takes more than that. Those are not enough in and of themselves. You create some space to do that, but when that space is continued to be void of the things I just finished talking about, then these problems continue, continue to surface. That's a very good point, very interesting point that you make there, because, I mean, I've heard it said that governments across Africa appear to be going exclusively for the military option, and, and there appears to be parallels across the, the continent. I mean, the situation that is currently taking place in Mozambique, of course, and in northeast Nigeria, where a decade earlier, a jihadist insurgency could have been put down, but because of the way the military reacted, trapping civilians between the insurgents and the army, it's simply grown and got worse and worse. When you have a scenario whereby the military activities are misaligned to some degree with the political intent, the governance structures, etc., then you have these sorts of things that occur. The actions that are taken by security forces should be aligned with concomitant actions taken in the form of the government governing institutions and what it does and what that intent is. This includes at the national level, but also at the in the local levels, so that you have efforts that are more coordinated and joined and synchronized as opposed to not. One of the things that I tried my very best to do with, with AFRICOM, when we would go into an area to conduct a training exercise or uh, conduct some military to military engagement. And for example, if we had to build a road or a school or, or training for engineers, that that activity also support the intent, the policies, the desires of the local governing bodies, as well as obviously being in, in accordance with the international set. And so I never thought of the military action in and of itself as the end all or to, of the be all. It has to be done in conjunction with other things and how those things are coordinated makes a very, very substantial difference in the outcome ultimately. 
And so when you have situations going on, as you mentioned in, in Mozambique, Firstly, started by a very devastating natural disaster. I mean, the, the, the hurricane, these things we can't plan, but how you respond to them in a coordinated, synchronized way so that services are delivered in a, the best ways you can be, so that that's understood by the security forces, so that their actions are supporting those other things, not supporting in a direct way, but so that it's not hampering or hindering. And those degrees of coordination when it comes to the professionalism of the security forces are the sorts of things that we try to put in place as we trained with, worked with, coordinated with, and supported the militaries as they did their job. And so as we talk about military to military cooperation, sustained engagement, it's not from the standpoint of being there and all we're doing is shooting bullets, dropping bombs, from time to time, indeed, that may be a part of the requirement. Make no doubt about it. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day increased professionalism of the forces, the security forces of that sovereign partner who has the ultimate responsibility for taking care of their people, securing their people, it is training in those sorts of things so that the actions of the military support the overall in intent and desires and wishes and will policies of the sovereign partner and then obviously when we as the united states are engaged in those activities we do our very best to be respectful of what the sovereign partner has as well and so that our policies are aligned so that they work better together because in the long run over time those are the things that will reduce the ability of these nefarious actors be they jihadists be they terrorists be they criminals, criminal gangs, they will be less effective when all those three things are working together. Now, just uh, last week, uh, General, the, the U.S. State Department designated uh, Al-Shabaab, which is the name of the, the um, insurgent group in Mozambique, as a terrorist organization. I mean, it's done that with other groups um, such as Boko Haram, ISWAP, etc. But that doesn't suggest, does it, that there is an appetite for the U.S. to step in in some way, either sort of boots on the ground or trainers, or is there a limited appetite in the U.S. for new involvements in conflicts like that? I Obviously, I'm, I'm not in the government these days, so I certainly cannot speak for what the end piece would be. But when it comes to designating those sorts of groups as terrorist organizations, one of the major things that that does is causes these groups don't just operate because they have all the resources. They, they are funded. You know, they are folks who provide resources and funds to them in the form of weapons that get transferred in. So designating these groups as a terrorist organization, such as the United States did, has other policy implications from the standpoint of how they get funded, who's funding them, trying to interdict that funding source, the, the transfer of weapons, and other things that they need to be effective. And so the terrorist designation doesn't just solely imply that the United States is there now and we will be a major, take a major role in taking direct action against those forces. It is some of those other aspects that critically are even more important because many of these jihadists who they, uh, some say certainly there's an ide ideology that's associated with it. But if you have a population whereby young men, and, that, and we talk predominantly about these are young men, and the only option that they have to do whatever they would do for trying to survive themselves or feed their families is to go out and either they get paid by these groups when they when they are they can't find meaningful employment in their places where they live so they have no other options and so you have these things coming together and so the designation of a group in northern mozambique uh, as a tied to uh, isis tied to al shabaab uh, has an impact on how they will also be able to continue to re receive finances and resources so all of that is together uh, with respect to these designations uh, as, a, as terrorist organizations, the impact it has, people that get 
the inability to travel, all the restrictions get placed upon those who are associated with these uh, bad actors, these terrorist organizations. And that, too, is critically important in reducing their impact. Now, General, we've got about a minute before we have to take another break. Nigeria has in the past flirted with mercenary groups from South Africa, uh, and, and I, it is rumored from, from Eastern Europe. Uh, when you look at such places, Nigeria, Mozambique, all the rest of it, um, where insurgencies are, are taking place, do, do you think it's got to the point where there needs to be more forceful external intervention of some sort? Yeah, thanks for that, Charles. I, I would not be the first one to, to subscribe to these private groups coming in to do the work of a country's legitimate security forces. No, I think that the more substantial and better response is to have better trained national forces, local security forces, that the people know and understand to do that job. To have someone else come in and do that for them is not a prescription that I would subscribe to. I think it, uh, in the I'll, long run. I'll ask you to just hold it there. Sorry to interrupt you. I've got to take a break, but I'll come straight back to you. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with General William Ward, the first commander of the U.S. Africa Command. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyugulu. My guest today is William Kip Ward, a retired U.S. Army general who, as inaugural commander, established the United States Africa Command, or AFRICOM, which was headquartered in Stuttgart, Germany. It made General Ward America's first black combatant commander to successfully establish the U.S.'s newest and uniquely positioned interagency combatant command responsible for all U.S. defense and security activities on the African continent and its island nations, with staff representatives from U.S. cabinet departments and agencies. He's seen as a distinguished leader, having commanded every echelon from lieutenant to general. Today, in addition to serving as a strategic advisor to the Vectris Corporation, General Ward also participates in the Atlantic Council's Round Table on Security in Mali and takes part in ongoing discussions on the role of diplomacy in global stability. And General William Kip Ward, the first commander of the U.S. Africa Command, or AFRICOM, is still with me from Washington. Thank you ever so much for staying with us. Uh, has what AFRICOM is doing in Africa changed since you left the command? Do you still see close alignment with African militaries? And is there a sense that African, or Afri that, that AFRICOM is still there for the long term? Uh, Charles, thanks for that. And I think the answer to that question is yes. Uh, I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of AFRICOM. However, through my interactions uh, with my African friends who I see from time to time, also from not over the last couple of years, but prior to the COVID-19 pandemic with trips to the continent, it is very clear to me uh, that the relationship that exists between the African states who desire to have the participation and cooperation with the U.S. forces, uh, that is still there. And the good news is it's occurring in many, many different places across the continent. I know those who have commanded behind me have continued the engagement, maybe not to the level that I used to do it because I just was pointed out it was very important for me to do my very best and also with my staff to cause the perceptions uh, that were on the table in 2007 to be explained in a way that allayed the fears and concerns that the establishment of AFRICOM was only uh, something to militarize our foreign policy, which was absolutely not the case. Uh, clearly, uh, we spent time allaying those fears and as was told to me by several African heads of state, uh, General, what you said you would be doing is what you are doing. And for those sorts of reasons, I believe that although there is still skeptic, skepticism, because that's going to be there always, you know, nothing is going to be perfect. But to the degree that the preponderance of the activities, the preponderance of what's being done, 
are clearly reflective of one, a relationship whereby there's respect for those with whom we partner, whereby there is an understanding for the role that security legitimately has, but also a healthy dose of respect for the role that other things have in creating a more stable environment. And that is whereby I believe AFRICOM continues to reinforce those things, but in the end, trying to do our best to support our own, meaning U.S. policy objectives, but also the policy objectives of our partner nations in respect of their sovereignty, in respect of their overall responsibility for the security and stability of their people. Well, listening to you talk uh, just now, General, and, and listening to you know some of the things you said um, previously, I do understand that a lot of what you did in Africa when you were commander of the U.S. Africa Command was based on U.S. foreign policy objectives, which determined where you went to conduct military activity. Given that, what would you say U.S. foreign policy objectives were in Africa when you were in command? And is it still the same now or has it changed? I mean, even if you're not, you know, still in the command, surely uh, I'm sure you're, you're, you're a close watcher of, of um, what is going on between the U.S. and Africa militarily. Yes, absolutely. I believe the basic foreign policy objectives re re remain the same. Uh, clearly, a more stable continent of Africa is in the U interest of the United States of America, it's in the interest of the African peoples, it's in the interest of the global commons. And so having a more stable continent of Africa for its people is in the U.S. foreign policy objectives, uh, national interest, but also for the nations of the continent of Africa. So I believe those objectives, broadly speaking, are the same. Clearly, uh, the United States of America goes where it will be invited to go. You talked about some nations that at the outset uh, did not have a, a desire to have the command be a part of what they were doing. And uh, that was helped. That was respected. Uh, but also many, many nations, in fact, more wanted us to be there than not because the creation of Africa Command signaled not some more some recognition of increased importance of the continent, but really a healthier respect so that there was a dedicated commander who spent his or her time, as the case could be someday, but in supporting the things that made a difference to our African partners. And when you had three separate commands doing that, that commander's time of, of either UCOM, and as you mentioned, I was a deputy commander of UCOM, but Central Command and, and Indo-Pacific Command was divided among other parts of their uh, operational area, where the creation of AFRICOM was a dedicated focus, and most leaders that I encountered welcomed the fact that there was one commander that they could deal with who did what was being done, taking into account looking at Africa like Africans look at Africa, and that is the entire continent and its Indian Ocean Island nations. And those things allow an increased emphasis on what was being done, a focus, and the thing that was critically important, the effort was not a disjointed effort or periodic effort, it was consistent. So we were, we were able to get to know our partners in a better way, build deeper relationships, deeper understandings, so that we had a greater potency to create conditions that made a difference for the people of the continent of Africa. And that came with building relationships, spending time in a sustained way so that our actions supported the desires of the African people. And obviously those things that we did were certainly aligned with our foreign policy objectives that I believe remain fairly consistent today. One of the things that, that I would note, Charles, is that when it comes to programs like the, like the presidential program for AIDS relief, those other programs, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, uh, those are things that have sustained over various presidential administrations. And the role of the United States military in that is a role of being supportive of those efforts as well, with various aspects being conducted. And so the consistency that was provided with the creation of AFRICOM 
that consistency continues today, as well as the policy objectives remaining fairly aligned. Okay, we're almost out of time, General. I wanted to ask you just anecdotally to tell us what it's like to achieve the status of a U.S. A US uh, four-star general. Well, I tell you, uh, Charles, when I started uh, my career, uh, that was not in my uh, dreams. Uh, it was a condition that I was led to because of doing something that I thought mattered, doing something that the nation asked me to do, having teammates around the world and various parts of the world that had common objectives about doing things to help create a more stable environment for people. You know, in the United States, you know, the Constitution is what we, that's what we take an oath to. And so, and that Constitution is to protect our people. Okay. So I was very, very blessed to have done all that I did and to achieve what I was able to achieve. Okay, uh, General, uh, I want to thank you very much indeed for joining us. General William Kip Ward, the first commander of the US Africa Command or AFRICOM. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and Washington. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.